Tell me when you're ready. We are. Alright then. Uh, so, sorry about that. This is part two, carrying on from where we left off, because uh, we had to go to next and put things back on and now, and we should finish it this lesson. Um, so then, on to the fear of crime. So then, the fear of crime can be developed by a few different ways. So, firstly, it can be as your experiences. For example, say you got moved. You were walking down the alley and you got moved. Then, the next time you went out, you wouldn't want to walk down the alley. You wouldn't want to go past people because you might feel uh, you might feel bad about going past because you remember past experiences, and that can carry on for a number of years or possibly even uh, the whole of your life having things like that. When you're scared of being moved or threatened. Um, so then, another way is that the media over exaggerate the point of crime. So if they are talking about things like terrorism and they're saying that it's getting closer to the United Kingdom then it uh, could impact on you and it could give you the fear of terrorism. So you might go out to work that day thinking, oh no, what happens if a terrorist is here? What happens if terrorists come over to the United Kingdom? When the likelihood of that is very slim. And if you're worrying about it, there's nothing that you can do. So the media will overemphasize um, the point of it and the possible dangers, when the possible dangers are very slim really and uh, you shouldn't have to worry about it. And finally, um, the last one is th through the word of mouth. You they can spread fear through you speaking to a family member or a friend, and you'll be relating to their story. So if they're telling you a story about a crime that happened, say, once again, you were threatened with a knife, um, then you might relate to that. You might think, oh, I'm not going to do this just in case someone falls out a knife. Or you might be scared of them, or you might not act your normal self because you're worried about what would happen if this happened and this happened. Um, or through a family member story, a friend story, or even just a story, a story that you've heard over the internet. Um, so then that would pass on the fear of growth. So from my, from my own research, four out of ten people um, who, uh, who lived, around, uh, lived in and around Wolverhampton city centre, they didn't, so they didn't feel safe in the area. Now that shows, even if we feel safe, because I feel safe and others will feel safe, even if we feel safe, it shows that nearly half of us don't, so that we've got to be careful about them and we've got to understand what they feel. Um, so then, um, so because they have the fear of not feeling safe, um, it'll show, it does show that the fear of crime is still around because they might be scared of muggings, knife attacks, uh, or even just people threatening them or antisocial behaviour towards them. So that is the fear of crime. So then, the impact of crime on victims. So this, this does relate to the fear of crime, because victims of crime often have a fear of crime and uh, are, are scared in case it does happen again. So uh, this, can, uh, this, fear, uh, this impact of crime can be uh, from anything from short term within a few hours of a state of shock sort of a feeling. So they might not believe that's just happened, they might go around, they might not know what to say if they do call the police. Um, so it can be something like a state of shock, or it could last up to the whole lifetime. Um, from being a victim of crime, you can get things like, uh, you can develop mental and medical issues. For example, trauma. I know people who've experienced crime and it's impacted them and they've had trauma. Now that can take as long or as short as possible to recover from. Um, so another thing is that uh, you can have post-traumatic stress disorder. Now that would say that you've been in, you've been after so after the crime has happened and it's impacted on you as a victim. Then post-traumatic stress is that you would be worried and fearful of what might happen linked with that, or if it happens again, and then that can carry on for throughout your life. So um, the government do set up helping schemes to help victims and even people who've committed crimes to try and stay away and uh, not let it impact them as bad. Um, so then, the impact of crime, the impact of crime on lifestyle. So then, say it's a burglary. Your house has been burgled. You come back and your possessions are gone. You might even come back and see them as they are there, which has happened to me. And now that, that crime, now that would make me feel, I don't feel safe around my area. That would make me think, 
I don't want to go out. But if it's a burglary, you also think, I don't want to stay in my house. So, as I'll put it, that if, you're, if they're coming and take your possessions of wealth and personal belongings that have an emotional attachment to you, it might impact you saying, I'm not safe in my house, and you might be worried. It can lead to things like a lack of sleep, worry, stress, and it can go to stuff like paranoia and uh, even post-traumatic stress disorder, which is just impacting on you, so you might be worried and stressing about if another burglary does happen, and you might also be uh, paranoid. So when you go out, you might think, I don't want to get into a bunch of people, don't want to run into a bunch of people, just in case something does happen. Um, so then, through my own questionnaire, I asked 10 people, do you hang around the streets when you get back from school, college, or work? And um, with your mates. And surprisingly, four out of 10 people said yes. That means just under half the amount of people who I asked said yes. Now, this is the age range between 16 to 21 of the people I asked. So they would be classed as you. Now, this means um, some people might stereotype them for being youth hanging around the streets or hanging around places like parks or um, children's play areas, or playgrounds, stuff like that. Now, they might just be hanging around there, even if they're not causing any crime. Um, the people might mistake them for doing antisocial behaviour, committing crime, um, going on to things like drugs and other things. So, even if they're not committing any problems, not committing any crimes, then people might still stereotype them and mistake them for antisocial behaviour and other things. So then, real and perceived figures. So then, in, 2002, in 2012, 228 crimes were reported in the city centre of Wolverhampton. So relating this close to home, that is 228. Yet, this report was done again in 2015, and only 195 reported crimes in the city centre of Wolverhampton. So that's showing over three years, the decrease has gone from 228 to 195, which is a good 30, 30, uh, 33. So that's showing that crime can be on the down. So according to these figures, crime rate has gone down in Wolverhampton. But when I looked into some other news and some other research, it says um, that the crime rate has gone up off different statistics suggest otherwise. So it's hard to tell when you see a fact or when you see a statistic what is actually spot on, what is telling you the crimes committee, or what is misleading you with slightly other um, facts and statistics, which doesn't always mean the amount of crimes. So it's very hard to tell what is real and perceived crime, um, perceived crime figures. Um, so when I was looking, I saw that Wolverhampton City Centre as the crime rate going down. That's overall, that's a main factor at the minute. But uh, looking into other websites, even big websites like BBC, they put different phrases in there and they don't always tell you the straight up facts. So, um, yeah. so moving on to collective costs of the community, including uh, cost of all these different things. So first of all, I saw class A drugs uh, cost the UK £20 billion per year. Now that's just class A drugs, that's not looking into class B and class C. And what a lot of people do nowadays, such as weed and other ones, those are the big things that I mean. But class A drugs cost £20 billion a year. Now the, all this money, which I'm about to say, this could go into different stuff like funding education, funding the public services, or even helping develop communities. Uh, so alcohol related crimes, now that cost the UK £11 billion uh, in the year 2010 to 2011. So once again, we're talking crazy money. Now the NHS, this is what a lot of row has been about uh, with Conservatives, as a lot of people believe that everybody will end up going to public health, uh, going to private health rather than the public NHS, because the NHS costs so much to run, it's getting the United Kingdom into more and more debt year by year. Um, so the NHS costs the UK around £115.4 billion pounds per year. So that's when you're working out the amount of money that's put in and the amount of money which you, they get out. Now, it's being funded 
not just by the government, charities are giving some towards it as well now. Um, but when it comes to stuff like general election, then that's one of the biggest factors at the minute, the United Kingdom's uh, NHS costs, to see whether they can, the government or parties who are looking to go in, go, uh, government, they are looking to see how they can tackle the NHS problem. And some of the ways are by reducing the funding and making it smaller, which will force more people to go private. And some people are looking at putting out to the European uh, nations, European Union, just to be able to fund the NHS. So uh, moving on to the victims and witness services in the United Kingdom, um, in the U UK government. So this cost around 66 million pounds. So this is a lot smaller. This is a lot of smaller figure uh, per year. And this helps people who have witnessed crime and victims of crime. So if you're struggling with post-traumatic stress or if you're struggling with worry or stress or any of the things due to the, what's happened with crime, then the UK government do funding £66 million pounds per year. But £66 million, pounds, would you rather, you'd much rather than having to take down the amount of money that they put in from drugs and from related crime, um, from alcohol related crimes. You'd like to see that start to go now. We want to get rid of all the drugs and the alcohol crime. And we want to be able to fund into the victims and witnesses to be able to help them rehabilitate. Right then, so the collective costs of crime. So this is just going on to a couple of things. So the UK government have to plan for four different things really. Firstly is anticipation. Second, so anticipation, what you're going to do, like, what you're going to do before you know that the crime's coming. So if a big event's happening, then you're going to have to anticipate lots of people turning up, things kicking off, maybe even stuff like drugs and alcohol abuse and stuff like that. Maybe all that will be going on. So that you have to have anticipation. Secondly, consequence. Now, you have to have a consequence. So after the events happen, there will be consequences going on all the way through. So they'll try and deal with it while it's in there, and then after, if it carries on. Uh, response, so when they're getting called out, and when they're being asked to do things, they have to go out and they have to help, and um, stuff like graffiti, the response to graffiti, um, and all that. Then cost per person in jail, we'll look at that. But firstly, we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about anticipation. So this is just in case that the victims are crying. So for example, CCTV and burglar alarms. So things like that, the UK, not only the government and not only public services, but even private homeowners or private company owners, they will invest a lot on getting CCTV and burglar, uh, burglar alarms just to make sure that they will save, in the long run, they'll save a lot of money as they won't get uh, robbed or burgled. Um, so then, this is, all this surveillance to, is ensure our safety and to ensure that the crime that is committed will be dealt to just, will be brought to justice and the person will receive their punishment. So whether that they are caught in the act due to a burglar alarm or whether looking into it after, they do catch the person due to CCTV. That's the way that the um, police and maybe even the armed forces overseas and in big investigations, that's what they might look into using. Um, so then the consequence, so they always put, the UK government always put a big set of cash aside in case something does happen. So as I mentioned here, the 7-7 uh, the seven, seven bombings, now they would have a set amount of money aside so that if something does happen like that, a big, well, all natural disaster, but a, um, if a big outcry happens, such as the 77 bombings, then the money will be funded into that to help the community get back up and running, to make sure that nothing um, is bad from it. So they try and clean up, they try and rebuild, they try and help the victims and the witnesses um, of the crime, try and help them by funding more money into that. So that this is the money that goes into it, which usually is just sitting aside waiting for something bad to happen. Um, so then, with, uh, with the money, um, they'll put into it, so that's what the consequence is. Response, so then, it'll be stuff like what we have to do uh, when graffiti happens. 
So then they were calling people, special people, um, to come and clean up the graffiti, whether this is in the local area, which is affecting local citizens, and anybody coming into here and there, they might think it's not a friendly neighbourhood, or they might think it's not nice. Uh, if it's abusive language, then obviously that's a big problem. Um, so that's one thing. And then the second thing is if you see stuff on the motorways or on big roads, where lots of people flow past there on day to day, they were calling people to wipe this graffiti off and uh, even put up um, graffiti resistant paint on buildings if it carries on happening. So um, once again, that's something that they would do. But at the end of the day, it costs more money and you could save a lot more money and put it into better things if this didn't happen. So then um, the last one, which is a big talking point really, the cost per person uh, to keep them in jail. Now, you might think, Yes, he's a criminal, so you put him in jail. Um, but at the end of the day, that's got a price. The UK government have to have to pay for them, and they take that out as some taxpayers' money. So um, looking at the figures, it costs the UK about thirty thousand pounds per year, maybe just under that, maybe just over. It depends on circumstance, but it's around thirty thousand pounds per year um, per person to keep them in jail. So that's including food, drink. Um, and stuff like keeping the cell clean, clothes and uh, other stuff um, and even putting on one or two activities like Xbox or stuff. Now, once again, we don't want to spend money on that but that's the cost of crime. Alright then, that's everything. Thank you.